podcast, Coronavirus Crisis, Carpe Diem, Let Us Seize the Day. This podcast helps us rise up. It helps us to embrace the possibilities and opportunities for spiritual and psychological growth in this time of crisis. And it does so by being thoroughly grounded in a Catholic worldview. I'm clinical psychologist Peter Melanoski with Souls and Hearts at soulsandhearts.com. It is excellent to be with you again today, and thank you for tuning in. This is episode 13, and we are releasing this episode on May 1st, the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. It is titled Body Set, Loving and Reverencing Our Bodies. And as a special guest, we have Dr. Andrew Sodegren of Rural Woods in Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Sodegren, Dr. Andrew is a clinical psychologist. He is the clinical director at Rural Woods, which is a ministry of the theology of the body in Cincinnati. He is also a longtime friend of mine, a dear friend, a dear colleague, and it is a pleasure and an honor to be with you again. We've had just we've had some feedback come in from our previous show that was very positive, and so very excited to have you back with us, Dr. Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Very happy to be here with you for another episode. Yeah, and we are talking about loving and reverencing our bodies. This is really interesting because, you know, you hear about loving your body and, you know, that's kind of popular out there right now. But this whole concept of reverencing our bodies, it's a, like takes it to a whole different level. So I'm really fascinated to hear what you're going to what you're going to share with us today and um, and to uh, and to be with you and to explore that together with our audience. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it as a. Um... Theology of the Body Ministry, or, or being involved with the Theology of the Body Ministry, this is a topic that you know, I think about a lot. It's it's something that's kind of near and dear to me, so I'm really delighted to be able to share some thoughts on on this theme with you and and uh, with the listeners. Um, you you launched this whole segment of episodes on body set by talking about loving our bodies, and you also talked about seeing our bodies as Catholic. Mm-hmm. Which is a really, really provocative uh, idea. <laughs> you know, what does that mean to see our bodies as Catholic, right? Right, right. Yeah, because we can see our, we can see ourselves as Catholics, but then all of a sudden, when you say my body is Catholic, there can be like this disconnect. Like, yes. whoa, whoa, what is that? Yes. Which is like really interesting to think about. Right, right. Yeah. And, and there are certain parts of my body that definitely aren't Catholic. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I, think, yeah. I mean, it's funny, but I think a lot of us probably feel that way. Oh, man, I, I'm, right? sh- I'm certain that that feeling is out there. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we have some parts that are more Catholic than others. <laughs> not like segments of the church, I guess, right? I mean, you know, um, yeah. Anyway. We are many parts. We are all We are many parts. That, yes, That's right. Yes. yes. Yeah. There's a certain analogy there, right? <laughs> So anyway, so so coming back to this theme of loving the body, what does it mean to love our body? I would like to to share a few thoughts from Theology of the Body, uh, which I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with. Uh, this corpus of teaching comes from John Paul II. Just very, very brief background. He, he wrote this as a text he was going to publish as a book as a, when he was a cardinal in Poland, and it was largely in response to the whole crisis over Humane Vitae and birth control. And so this was his attempt to respond to that that crisis. Basically, he wanted to give the church a renewed understanding of the human body, human sexuality, and human love in, in the divine plan to support the church's teachings on things like birth control. Uh, and then something un- unexpected happened. And that was namely, he got elected to the papacy. <laughs> like you do. You know, yeah. Sometimes. You know, it just happens right, right. sometimes, you know, <laughs> going along, writing books and all of a sudden wake up Ooh, one morning, right. you're wearing a white cassock. <laughs> so then he decides to publish, or instead of publishing this as a book, he breaks it up and uses it for his Wednesday audiences over about the next five years. And eventually it gets re- put back together in book form and translated and retranslated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to its current, the current shape that we have it. And this is a dense teaching. It's, it's challenging for uh, lay readers and scholars alike. There's still a lot of disagreement about how to interpret some aspects of it. I'm just going to share a few basic concepts that are really helpful to me. And, 
helps to help keep me grounded in my understanding of what it means to love the body in a Catholic way. So one of the things that he says in the early part of Theology of the Body, which is, is a little bit novel, but I think makes a lot of sense, is that the body, in a sense, is the sacrament of the person. Now, he's using sacrament here, obviously, in, a, in um, you could say, in a lower lowercase s form, not one of the seven sacraments. But there is a certain sacramentality of the body that he's speaking of. And what he means by that is, if you think about the function of a sacrament, it, it makes something visible in an efficacious way. It, it makes something really present that is, is otherwise uh, invisible and mysterious. Um, and that's the sense that he's using uh, the word sacrament here. So when he's talking about the sacramentality of the body, he's saying that the body, in a sense, makes present or reveals the person, this reality, okay. the reality that we call person or personhood. Okay, so that means that my body is a way of making me present to you. Correct. Okay. That's right. And, and in that way, we meet, Dr. Peter, you and I meet in and right. through our bodies. Without our bodies, right. we would not have a point of connection. Ah, so it's essential to relationship. It is. This is for really, a human being. It wouldn't be true for a human for, being. For, for a human, human being. being, right? Yes, right. And that's what makes human beings unique. In fact, is that all other persons, namely angels and the persons of the Trinity, they relate to each other in a direct spiritual way, whereas human beings, our experience of communion is mediated in and through our bodies. So this whole thing, like when we pray, it's a bodily thing. And when Absolutely. I talk to you, it's a bodily thing. And Absolutely. it's not just about it's not just about physical contact. It's not about just hugging or it's about any type of relationship is happening through our bodies. That is correct. That's right. right. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned prayer because we often think of prayer as a, a purely spiritual activity. Uh, and and it certainly is spiritual, but it's never divorced from the body. You know, which is this is so interesting to me why as Catholics more than any other um, denomination of Christians that I know of are so particular about how we use our bodies in prayer and in worship. Mm -hmm. You know, we kneel, we sit, we stand, we cross ourselves. We do all these things. We have all these little gestures and postures and things that we do because we believe that the body is, is integral to all of this. What we do with our body really matters because going back to John Paul II, what you do to the body, you do to the person. Right. 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 And so what I do with my body is, is a reflection of my personhood. It makes me present. It, it, it makes present in a visible way what my intentions are, what my attitudes are. Um, and what I do to the bodies of others, again, conveys my attitude towards them as a person. Yeah. So this idea of the, the body being, a, a being sacramental is, is, I think, really, uh, really helpful. Essentially, when you see a living human body, you are seeing a person, and even more so, a person who is called into communion with God. So we're seeing a person revealed in a body that has a relationship with God. And, and if this person is someone, a Christian in the state of grace, in a sense, we are seeing God in this person's soul revealed to through their bodies. Right. So whatsoever, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do to me. Right. Yes. So we're we're connected into this mystical body of Christ, too. Right. So our bodies are part of that body of Christ because they're obviously part of us. Right. That's right. right. That's right. So, okay. Yeah. For some. So this, you know, isn't, this... this isn't some negligible thing, then. We can't just, you know, sort of want to leave our bodies behind. I mean, that That's actually right. was part of like a number of heresies. Right. Manichaeism Correct. and so forth. There Correct. Was, where there was a devaluing of the body. Right. That's correct. And that yes. was actually a huge deal that St. Augustine fought against. Uh, That's back correct. In the fourth century. Right. So, you know, and it seems to be something that we struggle with, um, you know, kind of cyclically throughout church history. It seems to come up in new forms every few hundred years or so. Some new mistaken idea about the body and about the material world. 
Uh, and so we continue to have, continually have to go back and try to exercise these demons, so to speak. <laughs> and for right. some, it, it may sound strange to, to think of the body in, in this way. And just to share one little quote from John Paul II uh, that I think helps set this straight. He says, through the fact that the word of God became flesh, the body entered theology, I would say, through the main door. So what he's saying there is that we have to remember that God, who is infinite goodness, infinite holiness, took on our human flesh. And so our human body, a, a human body like ours, is participating in divinity and will do so forever. And so that conveys, in addition to the natural dignity that's there, because we're made in God's image, an even more abundant dignity to the body, because God himself took one up and, and really um, joined himself with our human nature, even our bodily human nature. That's like elevating the human body beyond all imagining. Like, exactly. Really, beyond all know? imagining. Yes. Yeah. In the person of Christ. Right. In the person of Christ. Exactly. Right. And so what this ultimately leads to in, in, in you know, John Paul's uh, writing is a, a extended reflection on how we should regard the body of other people, other people's bodies. He's, he's remember his main thrust here is, is about the relationship between man and woman and love and sexuality. And so he's going to eventually get around to this idea of, of reverence towards the human body. And he, he means this primarily in our re, uh, reverence towards other people's bodies. But I would argue, and I think with good basis, that if we're going to extend reverence to other people's bodies, it, it, we have to extend that to ourselves as well. And we can't abstract ourselves out as if my body is is somehow less than everybody else's body. Right. Like the we all have body the same. That the, yeah, the one body that doesn't need to be reverenced exactly. is my body. Right. That just doesn't compute. Right. I we do it. see this a lot, don't we, though, uh, Dr. <laughs> yeah. Peter? I mean, in ourselves and certain in our patients, too. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, sure, God loves everybody. Uh, well, but does but god actually love it? yeah is yeah, there an yeah, asterisk, yeah right like the footnote the footnote right <laughs> except for this person and maybe a couple others right? right 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 so god loves everyone it means god loves me and he loves you dr peter yes uh, just want to share that with you today. <laughs> I feel very affirmed. Thank you. Dr. Good. <laughs> Good. But it also means that God loves our bodies. Right. Yeah. He goes, he loves our bodies. He loves all of us uh, so much so that he wanted to be united to us. So this idea of reverence, he connects it with the, um, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, fear of the Lord or in, in the Latin pietas, which, you know, can be translated as, as piety or, or I think better reverence, this attitude of reverence. And I don't know if you caught it, by the way, but this, this came up actually in the readings for Mass on Sunday. Okay. Uh, the second reading from First Peter, uh, he says, conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning. Mm -hmm. uh, and some translations have that as fear, as in like fear of the Lord. It's the same concept, this piety, fear of the Lord, reverence this almost awe that we should have in the presence of something holy. Mm -hmm. This is what he says we should have, the attitude we should have towards the human body. Uh, and and this, is, this is startling. All right? This is startling because, as we talked about last time, it's hard for us even just to accept our bodies, right. let alone treat them with this attitude of reverence. Right. All right? There's right. so many things that can get in the way uh, from certainly accepting our bodies, but even more reverencing them. Yeah. And this is stuff that happens because of our psychological baggage, our history, our trauma, you know, things like that, that we, we, that we talked a lot about in the last, in the last episode, mm -hmm. we got into why it can be hard. Anything that makes it hard for us to accept our bodies is going to make it hard for us to reverence our bodies. Right. But I think there are some people that do have like this grudging acceptance of their body. They're going to say, okay, this is what I've been given. I know I'm supposed to see it as a gift. They kind of treat their bodies maybe stoically, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they, but they haven't seen what we're talking about. And I'm curious just about like what gets in the way of that vision. 
I mean, first of all, the first thing that comes to my mind, just as I'm thinking about it right now, is that it's divinely revealed. Like, we're not going to know this without divine revelation, right? Like, it's not going yes, to be apparent to the, to, the, to the unaided human reason, right? So I agree. So some of it's just, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, human reason can get around to most of what we talked about last time around accepting the body. It's a good idea to accept my body and even to some degree to love my body, to take good care of it, right? But to go to the the point of reverence, I, I only think we, we really get to that through the incarnation, that we have to really take to heart what God did for us by taking on human flesh, living among, among us, and even suffering and dying for us, that in all of that, he brought a, such a level of dignity and honor to the human body that it's because of that that we're inspired and moved to this level of reverence. Um, right. I think that's that's really crucial. And so as we talk about and work on obstacles to reverence, a lot of it, I think, goes back to or unravel, unraveling those obstacles comes goes back to being able to really appreciate God's love for me and what he's done for me and that he wants a relationship with me that includes my body. Uh, and certainly in our, our human experience, all the experiences we've had of how other people have treated our bodies, especially parents and maybe intimate partners or, um, you know, any significant relational experience we've had uh, can, can create you know, wounds and, and blockages that make it hard for us to, to really see the body as a good thing that, mm -hmm. that God would find lovable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, creates uh, limitations for us, so, you know, in our relationship yeah. with God. So what I'm thinking is, you know, so the faculty of imagination, we may have to lead with that. We may have to imagine this, like, or be open to imagining God loving us in our bodies. Like, we may have to actually visualize that in some way. We have mm -hmm. to be just really open to that. And that may be something that we just have never done. That's you know? a great point. You know, and I, I often encourage that, actually, in prayer. And we incorporate this in, into, you know, work, the work I do in session with patients sometimes, too, of... Let's say, for instance, you know, we're working with some painful memory of something that happened in childhood and uh, bringing oneself as a child at that age uh, to Jesus mm -hmm. and prayerfully imagining how he would respond and how he would interact with myself at that age, including how he might touch or not right. touch me, uh, right. things like that. I also will sometimes encourage people to uh, to meditate on the scriptures in the Gospels where the, the children, the disciples are trying to prevent the children the from children, coming to right. Jesus. Right. It it says in, I think it's, I think it's in all the synoptics. Uh, I could be wrong about that, Matthew, Mark, Luke. But I know that at least in a couple of them, he mentioned specifically that he laid his hands on them. Uh-huh. Right. And that's kind of the, the end of that little episode is that, you know, after he rebukes the disciples and says, let the children come to me and so forth, he, he, uh, the children come to him and he, he blesses them and he, and he lays his hands on them. Right. Right. So I think it's, it can be extremely fruitful to, to meditate with that. I, I have, I often invite my patients to do it in, in sort of two ways. The first is to put themselves in the scene as one of the disciples um, but also seeing their child self as one of the children, mm -hmm. as if to say, I'm trying to convince Jesus that my child self should not come to him. <laughs> so you see what I'm doing there. I'm trying right, to get them right. to enact this more explicitly, right? right? right. Yeah, Jesus, exactly. you don't want, you don't want that part of me, right? right. You don't want that right. part of me and trying to right. tell that part too, you know, you don't want to go to him, right? Cause right. Because he's right. going to reject you or whatever. He's right. going to hurt you. He doesn't have time for you, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so to pray with that and really work through that until they get to the point where they feel some softening of, okay, well, maybe it's okay right. to let that part of me go to Jesus. And ultimately working up to that point of really from the perspective of the child self, what would it be like to go to Jesus and to feel him put his hands on you yeah, and to touch yeah. you in that way? With all of his his divine love present in that very incarnate moment, and 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 the wild card in all of this, when I do things like this with my clients, is that 
Jesus is going to do things too. Because this isn't some sort of like, you know, just some sort of reflection exercise or something. This is prayer. And God, right. our, our Lord gets active in this kind of thing, you know, and it's amazing what can happen in those kinds of, in those kinds of encounters, you know, in a, in a session and when people do this on their own. Because this is where we're bringing together both the natural and the spiritual realms. You know, it's like it's like you're working in both, right? Because the impediments are in both. Yes. And yes. so so it's really powerful. It's really powerful to bring those both together to understand that there there's, you know, the both Yeah, that's are a active, great point. Both realms. Yeah, because yeah, we don't know, we don't when we open up like that, we don't know what God's going to do with us in that time of <laughs> prayer, right? I mean, we know how the we know how the story is in scripture, right? So we have some basis, but but he may uh, respond to us and, and act and, and work with us in that imagery in ways that we we don't expect uh, right. and are surprising, right? Um, and and so for some uh, for some people it can make them afraid to try. Yeah, right. and it can be really comforting to have another person there sometimes too. Yes, right. To kind of be yes. with you. And this is you know these kinds of things are not unique to therapy. I mean. There's, there's nothing necessarily inherently therapy based in all of this. This is prayer, right? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, people can do this and then you want to be careful and not overextend your reach, right? If you're, you know, if you're really working with somebody who's got a trauma history and you're not trained in doing like proper trauma work and they're experiencing, you know, ab reactions, they're kind of going flashing back and so forth. You, you want to be really respectful of that and not go where you're not supposed to. But absolutely for, for a lot of us, you know, if you're in a prayer group or you, you know, or you pray with your spouse, I mean, this kind of stuff can ha- can happen and it doesn't take a professional to be with you on that. I mean, right, otherwise, right. otherwise we'd have to, you know, we'd have to have a, 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 a clinic at every corner, you know, or something like that. We don't, we don't need that. Right. So, right. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, this is, this is accessible stuff. That's what souls and hearts is all about. It's we're trying to like bring this, you know, this psychologically informed approach to removing these obstacles to relating with God to the, to the, to the, to the public. Uh, that's really what that's all about. All about. Just kind of like the theology of the body ministry is trying to bring this body of work from St. Paul, John Paul II to, to the people as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we've already touched on on a few things that that listeners can try on their own in prayer, and uh, we'll come back. I'll, I have a couple other suggestions that we'll come back to in a little bit, but I do want to say a little bit more about this this idea of reverence and and kind of what it looks like. Okay, you know, in, in sort of concrete fashion, and I think a helpful way to do that is to think about the liturgy. Uh, our, our sacred liturgy as Catholics, and if we think of the the way that we regard the sacred vessels at Mass, the chalice, you can think of the monstrance, even the tabernacle itself, not the tabernacle with the hosts inside of it, but the tabernacle itself, that these things are are, are designed for a sacred purpose. So there's a great deal of uh, care and artistry that goes into them. Uh, they're, uh, you know, the church tells us they should be made out of precious materials uh, and, and they're set aside for special use. And there are, there are norms and rights around how they are to be commissioned and, and decommissioned uh, and things like this. And so there's all this care and they're adorned too. They're adorned, you know, mm-hmm. with, with, uh, with care to make them as beautiful as we can. And I think this is a good manifestation of what this attitude of reverence looks like. And I don't think it's going too far to say that that's how it should be. That's how our attitude should be to our bodies. Because after all, Jesus comes to us in and through our bodies. That's why we have the seven sacraments. They each involve the body. He, he washes our bodies in the font of baptism. Uh, he anoints us with oil, uh, and he feeds us with his his own body and blood. Right? We 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 literally consume him. He enters into our mouth, and and we eat him. And and it's all of these acts are both bodily and spiritual acts at the same time. Right. And Saint Paul, of course, refers to the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So we often talk about, you know, the, the dwelling, uh, the indwelling of God in the soul by sanctifying grace, which is absolutely true, but we can't divorce that from the body. Our, our souls, <laughs> you know, are intimately united with the body and are, and are always meant to. Like we, we sometimes can fall into thinking that, that at death, you know, the, the idea of the soul separating the body, it's like it's liberation. Uh, when in fact, this, this is more like a, um, you know, like a deformation or, or, or a, like an a unnatural uh, rupture or something. An like unnatural that. rupture is a perfect way yeah. to put it. That's right. Yeah. Cause the, you know, after all we're, we're eventually the, the end goal that we all hope for is the resurrection of the body, you know, and, uh, in, in which we receive our glorified bodies. And right. so the human soul is always meant to be incarnate, always meant to be embodied. And so our union with God, while it's primarily in the soul, in a certain sense, is meant to be an incarnate communion. And that's why he gives us the sacraments. And, and I think that helps us to begin to visualize, okay, what, what would reverence towards the body really look like? So like we care for the sacred vessels, we need to care for our own bodies. We need to, to take care of them, to, to, to make sure that we're, we're doing our part to keep them healthy and to keep them uh, functioning in the way that they were designed to function, right? Or, and, and we can fall, you know, into neglect, and we can also fall into overindulgence, uh, or we can we can fall into uh, being overly controlled or, or you know, harsh towards the body. And and all of these, you know, are natural tendencies in a way that they're very common, but they fall a little bit short of that reverence that that uh, that I think that we're directed towards. And this is true of how we treat our bodies. It's also true of how we, we treat others' bodies. And one other point with that I wanted to, to throw out there is, is how we adorn the body, right? I mentioned how sacred vessels are, are meant to be beautiful and great care is put into their, their making uh, to make them beautiful. And everything with the liturgy is supposed to have a certain beauty and awe related to it. And I think the same is, is true of the body in a certain way, that, that it's actually a very good and Catholic thing to have some properly ordered now attention to the body, adorning the body, beautifying the body, displaying it in a reverent, respectful way. And this also gets into modesty, that um, the way that we clothe our bodies, the way that we present ourselves uh, you know, in, in regards to how we dress, can either debase the body, profane the body, or it can present it in a, in a dignified uh, and reverent sort of way. And John Paul admits that there's a certain amount of cultural, um, there's, a, there's a strong cultural aspect to this. Uh, what may be considered modest in one culture may not be exactly the same in another culture. Uh, and that's, you know, due to historical conditions and climate and all sorts of things. Um, but it's also true that in a certain sense that the parts of the body that we're most concerned about covering uh, are in a sense the most sacred in a certain sense mm -hmm. uh, because they're involved in the, the acts of reproducing or, or bringing better, uh, bringing new life, cooperating with God to bring new life into the world, mm -hmm. right? Which is one of the most sacred things that we do. Um, and so this whole attitude of, of reverence should give us pause to think about how I care for my body, how I dress my body, the kind of self-care that I engage in. Uh, there's an error of going too far into vanity in which I'm really about um, what I get out of this, the kind of attention that I draw to myself, trying to gain the, uh, uh, the favor of others in, in a disordered sort of way. Right? And that's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about glorifying God by taking care of and presenting our bodies in a dignified way. And that's, that's really what we're getting at. Yeah. 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 And this also applies, of course, to how we treat other people's bodies. Right? We can look at another person's body uh, as, as merely an object, as something for us to, uh, to do what we want with. And this, when we, when we uh, fall into this attitude, uh, we end up treating people in less than dignified ways. 
uh, either as as either as objects of of desire or objects of repulsion, um, of of uh, objects that we would like to control uh, for our own purposes, rather than uh, truly reverencing uh, reverencing them as the persons that they are. Uh, and and this should give us all pause. We we all fall into this. Every single one of us. Uh, and and there's a, a need here to reflect and to work with God to understand how do I fall short of this call to reverence my body and to reverence the bodies of others. And I think to to unpack that, it's helpful to think about again Christ's body, how He used his body through his life on earth. One way to, to do this is just to reflect on Christ's hands, for instance. How did Christ use his hands as he was going through his 33 years or so on earth? Hands that healed uh, and comforted, hands that uh, drove out demons, hands that broke bread, uh, hands that, that built things. Right as a, a carpenter. Yeah, right? the, the, we're, this is released on May first, right? Saint Joseph the Worker, right? How those hands yeah, learned exactly. from. You can imagine Saint Joseph's hands on Jesus' hands, showing him hand to hand how this is done. You know, at the workbench. Yes. Bench, you know. Yes. What a beautiful image. Absolutely. Right. And all so all the things that Jesus did with his hands, in a sense, have this extra special dignity now. And many of the same things that we do in various ways. Um, but there are also ways in which, um, you know, we use our hands that are unbecoming, so to speak, uh, of our dignity and the dignity of others. And we can also, of course, you know, still being near to Good Friday, reflect on uh, how Jesus' hands suffered for us uh, and how we sometimes in our bodies accept suffering uh, and can offer that for others. Right. And so thinking of our bodies in relation to Christ's body in this way, I think really helps uh, to develop that, that attitude of reverence. And it helps shine a light, too, on, on where I maybe habitually tend to, uh, to fall short of that. So we, we may have to lead with the intellect and the imagination here. You know, we may not just feel it and then from feeling it go into, you know, understanding it. We may need to like actually use our imagination and deliberately meditate on these things, direct our thoughts along these lines in order to, uh, in order to sort of lead the way for the rest of ourselves to come along. I, I think that's true. And, and uh, you know, and that's why I hope this uh, podcast is helpful to, to the listeners and kind of uh, spurring them on in, in that regard. And, you know, can, can I can I just interrupt you real quick there? Because we we course. did have we did a we did have a, a listener, Liz in Indiana. She wrote, "This is about the exercise that you did in the last episode." Mm -hmm. And Liz says, "Quote: I really enjoyed that exercise with Dr. Sodergren. Very relaxing and affirming. Today, I love my body. I do wonder if that changes from day to day. Probably yeah. depending probably depending on what might be freed to come up." Right. So she's recognizing Liz is recognizing that her attitude towards her body can vary like from from hour to hour, day to day, you know, and this is like kind of really an interesting thing, because I think a lot of us have had that experience. Like there are times where we might be really disappointed in our bodies, not accepting them. And other times we're like really appreciative of our bodies, you know. And, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that can go into that. So that's one of the unique things, too, about human beings is that we change. <laughs> right. angels angels don't change they, right. they're 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 constant in a way human beings change and it's because we are bodily uh, right. we're bound by space and time and so we change the body itself changes and our attitudes about the the body can change as well um depending on all sorts of things uh so yeah it's a it's a certain kind of thing that that um it's an ongoing work for us it's just, yeah. I, I, I would lump it in with the, the ongoing work of, of, uh, of interior integration and, and ultimately sanctification. Yeah. Um, you know, as you, you kind of talked about towards the end of the last episode, uh, the whole need to 
to be purified of our and our, our attitudes towards our bodies, either in this life or the next. <laughs> right. Sort of, you can pay me now or pay me later as far as like the, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. resolving these things, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Either work through it now or work mm-hmm. through it later, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that that uh, kind of the take home one of the take home points for me from from theology of the body, and this isn't uh, um, a term that JP two uses explicitly. I don't think uh, maybe he does, and I'm ripping it off, but I, I can't recall <laughs> if he does. And, and that is th- that the body is liturgical. Mm. That's kind of what I've been saying, and that's just a nice summary. The body is liturgical. It's it's created for divine worship to participate in divine worship. Uh, and anything designed and created for divine worship needs to be treated with the utmost care and respect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm really curious about like, what do you guys do at Real Woods? Like, what's that? What's that all about over there? What you guys have got going on at that at that ministry? Well, Rua Woods is a Theology of the Body ministry here in Cincinnati. We have been in existence now for uh, just over 10 years, and it was founded by a group of of lay uh, Catholics of their own initiative uh, to bring St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body to the greater Cincinnati area. And at first, that was primarily done through classes and workshops and various um, on-site programs, and gradually a call was discerned uh, to to move the ministry in a slightly different direction. We still do some of that, but uh, our focus now is primarily on bringing Theology of the Body into uh, classrooms in our Catholic schools throughout okay. uh, throughout the nation um, and, okay. and maybe even beyond. So over the last several years, we've been developing a theology of the body curriculum that is age appropriate for kindergartners all the way through 12th grade. And it's designed to be integrated into what Catholic school teachers are already doing. Uh, and we're trying to get this out there as, as widely as possible into our Catholic schools and also into the hands of homeschoolers. Uh, and so if anyone's interested in learning more about that curriculum, uh, you can go to ruawoodspress.com. Now, rua is the Hebrew word for spirit or breath, and it's R-U-A-H, then woods, uh, ruawoodspress.com. Now, the other half of our ministry, so to speak, is what I do, and that is the psychological services uh, branch. And we provide uh, psychological services, uh, psychotherapy, psychological assessment, uh, you know, to uh, um, a whole range of uh, age range of people and, and uh, uh, presenting issues, but based in a Catholic anthropology. Uh, so trying to see the person from the standpoint of our, our Catholic faith. And um, we are based here in Cincinnati for those services. Uh, the curriculum, of course, is, is um, goes everywhere. Uh, right. But in terms of psych services for now, we're, we're locally based locally based yeah so basically you're trying to take everything that we've been talking about here about accepting the body loving the body reverencing the body and getting that out through both through the curriculum that you were talking about for the k-12 through crowd and then right. also on the on the psych side where you're the clinical director you've got a couple right. of psychologists with you right um you know and that's that's a, that's a beautiful thing and i will say that i have frequently referred to you and to your other clinicians at rural woods because we're kind of neighbors right we're only like 90 minutes away from each other that, so, and, and, yes you know? <laughs> yes we are yeah. so so uh so that has been a great gift it was a great thing when you moved to cincinnati a uh, little backstory i did recruit dr dr andrew here pretty hard to come to indianapolis back in the day uh, but uh but he found himself in cincinnati which was great because at that time i didn't have I didn't have uh, somebody to refer to there either, so mm-hmm. um, so that was that was yes. good. I'm still, I'm still getting you over the rejection. You did recruit me. I'm, not I, not I'm hard enough, my over, friend. I, I'm still re- getting over the rejection. You know, I'm still getting over the rejection. It's okay. It's something we'll work out. You know, that's right. <laughs> you know, well, what's something. that old saying about you know good uh, good fences make good neighbors or something <laughs> like that? Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. yeah. You're setting those limits and boundaries. That's you right. know, you're doing it. You're working through that. Nine, ninety minutes. Uh, ninety yeah. minutes between us is is just just. Uh, seems to work really well. <laughs> ah, it's funny. 
Uh, Dr. Jerry Crete, who was a co-founder of Souls and Hearts, um, the CEO of Souls and Hearts, he actually has a, um, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Andrew, but he has a, uh, a course that's just released a week or two ago on what happens when pornography is discovered in the marriage. It's really geared to, to both the husband and the wife, and that's available at soulsandhearts.com. We are really encouraging people to register for this podcast to keep up with what's happening. We have also just released a new course called The Catholic's Guide to Choosing a Therapist. So this is 90 minutes of Dr. Jerry and I kind of going through like all the ins and outs, all the little details about choosing a therapist. And so, you know, any of you in in the Cincinnati area could go through that course and be totally ready to go in. And, uh, you know, if you need therapy to go to Rural Woods, but it's actually got a lot of exercises, you know, about like just helping people step by step, baby step by baby step through the whole process of finding a therapist. So, um, I also want to let people know that uh, starting next uh, starting next week, the frequency of this podcast is going to go down to once a week. We're going to do longer episodes, but that's going to free me up to really build up the community aspects of it. Because until now, it's been kind of a hub and spoke model where the email address has been the hub, where each of you have been coming into contact with me. Many of you have been coming into contact with me. And I've really wanted to find a way for us to be able to communicate together more like in a web rather than in a hub and spoke model. So I've been putting a lot of energy into how do we build the infrastructure on the website so that we can come together as a group. There's going to be a lot of exciting things happening with that uh, in the next in the next few weeks. So please keep that in your prayer. And so with that, uh, I don't know, any final things you want to leave our listeners with, Dr. Dr. Andrew? What do you think? Anything? I'm just so grateful for uh, for you, Dr. Peter, for Souls and Hearts, for the opportunity to be with you on these two episodes and I hope they've been helpful to the listeners and maybe God willing, we can do this again sometime. I would love to be able to do this again sometime. If you have questions for Dr. Andrew, you can email them to crisis at soulsandhearts.com and I will personally make sure that they get to him. And you can also call the uh, voicemail for this podcast, which is 317-567-9594. We definitely want to stay in touch. If there was something in here that really moved you or something that you thought was really great or something that you thought was really problematic or off, let us know. We're looking for feedback of all kinds. And I'm also very grateful to you, Dr. Andrew, for, for taking the time and sharing with us your, your clinical experience and your wisdom. And so I, I definitely want to do all kinds of joint projects with you in the future with Souls and Hearts. Hope you're a frequent contributor uh, to what we're trying to do and getting that word out. So thank you again, my dear friend. And with that, we will call it a wrap and we'll invoke our patroness and our patron, Our Lady, Undoer of Knots. Pray for us. St. John the Baptist. Pray for us. 